if you saw the title in the bulletin for today, it's, what does the Bible say about political power? And if everybody's mad at me after today, I'll think I'll dead my job. First Samuel chapter 8. What does the Bible say about political power? We'll be doing that this Sunday, next Sunday, both from First Samuel chapter 8. Uh, if you go on to the next slide for me, Dave. If the election of 1824, between John Quincy Adams on the left and Andrew Jackson on the right, uh, show, show us that uh, there is nothing new under the sun, just as the Bible says. When the election was over... Andrew Jackson had the most votes from the people and the most votes in the Electoral College. But because there were four men on the ballot that year, he didn't have a majority in either. And the Constitution says in the 12th Amendment, when that happens, the election proceeds on into the House of Representatives. But when that does happen, only the top three in the election move into the House. In this case, they had four The fourth person uh, being Henry Clay, Speaker of the House from Kentucky, so his name was dropped off the ballot. He went into the House of Representatives. Andrew Jackson was convinced this was just a procedure. They'll recognize that I had the most votes of the people and the most electoral votes, and they'll vote for me as president, except Henry Clay made a deal with John Quincy Adams to throw his weight behind Adams so that Adams could become president in exchange for Adams nominating, selecting Henry Clay as Secretary of State. Because in 1824, the path to the presidency for future presidents was not the vice president as it is today, generally, but it was the Secretary of State. Sir Henry Clay was kind of laying the road road work for his own presidential bid in exchange for giving his votes to John Quincy Adams. And so when the vote went to the House, Uh, Adams won, and Jackson lost, even though he won the most votes of the people and the most votes in the electoral college, and he was outraged. So in 1828, he ran again against John Quincy Adams, and back then, the the kind of social contract candidates had with each other is, is they would not go after each other publicly. They would let their lieutenants do that. And John Quincy Adams... Uh, followers, his, his lieutenants, spread rumors that Andrew Jackson's wife, Rachel, was a bigamist and adulteress. Now John Quint- or Andrew Jackson worshipped her. Her name was Rachel. Worshipped her. She was a devout Christian woman, very dedicated to her church, the Presbyterian church. And technically speaking, they were correct. In her divorce from her husband, 30 years before when she married Andrew Jackson, the paperwork had not made it to the judge in time for him to sign off on the divorce. And you can imagine what it was like in 18, or 1790 when that took place, around 1790. He didn't get it signed in time for their, when their marriage took place. So technically, she was what they said she was, although they dragged it up from 30 years before, and it was a procedural thing was all it was. The stress upon her from that was so significant and so serious that on December 22nd, 1828, just a month after the election, roughly a month after the election, she died of heart failure. Never saw her husband inaugurated, and Andrew Jackson blamed John Quincy Adams and all the people working for him for her death. And at her funeral, which I believe was on Christmas Eve, I could be wrong enough, but on her funeral he said, May God forgive her murderers, because I never will. There's nothing new under the sun when you think of what politics can be and can do to people. We don't know those stories because they're kind of lost in our history and we don't learn them when we're in school of what power does to people. Go on to the next slide. There's a Pew Research poll of Americans Trust in Government that was done recently Going back to 1958, it's at its lowest point now in trust in government as it has been in 60 years. If you look at the graph, it begins moving south during the Vietnam War, continues south then when Nixon became president and Watergate and so forth, 
Uh, then the Carter years came and the Malays, remember his famous Malay speech in the summer of 1979? And then the uptick during the Reagan years comes off during the Bush years and uh, at the beginning of the Clinton years, but then takes off again when the economy was so good in the 90s and then has fallen pretty uh, steadily since 9-11. And now it's as lowest place it was, it's been since 1958. Look at the next slide. James Madison wrote in the Federalist paper number 51, if men were angels, no government would be needed. <laughs> Thomas Paine wrote in Common Sense, you've probably heard this, government even in its best state is but a necessary evil and its worst state is an intolerable one. We're going to talk today and next week of what the Bible says about political power. I'm not going to talk about candidates. I'm not talking about immigration. I'm not talking about guns or free trade. What God says about political power, because what this says in 1 Samuel 8 is very clear. With that, I want to mention this too. At our information booth, you can register. There are forms there. You can register to vote if you've not done that. The forms are right there. If you fill one out, we'll get them down in the county for you. If you haven't registered to vote but would like to, those forms are at the information booth, and we'll get them filed for you. So 1 Samuel chapter 8. Go on to the next slide. Uh, like I said, it's not about immigration, candidates, guns, or anything like that. It's about what God says to us about political power. And this came about, what we're going to study today came about because Israel had reached a point where they said, we want a king like everybody else has. And the reason for that was, it says in 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 19. The people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we'll be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. We want a king who will make us safe who will make us secure, who will fight our battles. We want God here, but we want someone we can see, someone who will go out in front of us and lead the way uh, as our protector. Well, here's what we're going to look at, to look at today. So let's look at uh, 1 Samuel 8, and I'll read through it. And uh, you can notice I've circled here a word that dominates and controls this text, and it's the word Take. It appears so many times you can't avoid it. It links the whole thing together. Samuel said, This is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. Now, let's make this note right up front. When God warns the people here about a king, he's not warning them about what bad kings will be like. He's just saying kings. Good kings will do this. Bad kings will do this. This is what a king will do. He's not simply talking about the bad ones. Just kings. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses. And they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties. Others to plow his ground and reap his harvest. Still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. So you can see this, this word take is controlling the passage, a key word in the whole passage. And what... God is warning the people of here in this text are three things he wants them to know up front. Here's what you're signing on to. When you trade me in for a human king, this is what you're going to get. Number one, he's saying, there will be no limit to a king's taking. That's what kings do. They take. It doesn't matter if the form is a king as they knew it in the ancient world, if the form of the king is in a parliament, a congress, a president, it doesn't matter. The point here isn't thinking in terms of a person. It's who controls the power. And he says here, when you give the power to someone else and you take it from me, here's what they're going to do. There will be no limit to what they take. And he says here, they're going to take your sons. 
As if that's not bad, they're going to take your daughters too. Then they're going to take your best that you have. They're going to take this thing. There will not be any limit to what they take. Number two, he says, when you do this, they will take for their own purposes and their own plans. You, the people, he's saying, will come after that. And he says it clearly here. They'll take it to run in front of his chariots. Some will be in sign uh, for thousands and fifties, others to plow his ground, reap his harvest, others to make uh, officers for weapons and equipment for his chariots. In other words, they, he will take from you in order to accomplish what he wants to do. It'll be his plan, his purpose that rules first. You, the people, will come after that. And third, you can't say no. He's a king. That's what kings do. They just take. And God is saying to the people, you're trading me and what I've been with you for this time for this. And, and when this happens, he says at the end of the text, you will cry out to me for help, but I'm not going to listen. You will bear the burden of this choice you're making. Now, God foresaw that this day was going to come. So if you have a Bible... Go to the left of your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 17. God foresaw that this day was going to come. And so, looking forward to that day, he's giving parameters or restrictions to these men who would be kings. In other words, looking forward, God is saying, there's going to come a day when you're going to have a king, and when that comes... I'm giving these restrictions to what a king is to be. Deuteronomy 17, verse 14. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, and have taken possession of it, and settled it. Now the context here is Moses has led the people out of their in slavery in Egypt. They're on the cusp of the land that God was promising them. They're like on the doorstep. And so he's giving them this final instructions until they enter the land, and this instruction is about kings. And you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us. Be sure to appoint over you the king the Lord your God chooses. He must be from your own brothers. That is, he can't be, he goes on to say, a foreigner over you who is not a brother Israelite. Verse 16, the king moreover must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you not to go back that way. Horses were symbols of strength, military power, prestige. Uh, and he's saying here, the king is not to have a lot of horses hanging around because that's going to lead him down a path of pride, self-sufficiency. I've got this, I'm in charge. He says, he can't multiply the horses. 17, verse 17. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. So uh, God, uh, and we don't have time to get into it here, but he regulated the practice of especially people in power uh, with his multiplying wives. Uh, it wasn't like it was something that was practiced by everyone because you had to have means. If you're going to have two or three or four wives and they're all having children, you've got to have a lot of money. Not just every person could do that. So people in power would ac 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 accumulate more wives, a polygamy-type marriage arrangement. It was something practiced in the ancient world. And so what God did was he was restricted. It was not his plan. It wasn't how he wanted his plan to be. God's plan from the beginning when he created was for a man and woman to come together in marriage. A man, a woman. He's regulating it here, and he says to the king, don't be multiplying wise because they will lead your heart in another place. Last, he says, he must not accumulate large amounts of silver or gold. Because in the process of doing that, the people, uh, the king's heart will be drawn after uh, that wealth. Uh, Jesus taught this uh, later, years later, when he said, wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. So if you accumulate lots of silver and gold and what they can give you, your heart is going to be where that treasure is. 
a, a good example, and I don't mean to, to, uh, to, to, to pick on this, but it makes a really good illustration. If a person, uh, like we, we uh, as a congregation here, collectively bought the new chairs for this room back in January and February. Everybody bought a chair for like $55, and that was a, a, how we did it. Let's say, instead, a person uh, gave us the money, I think it ended up being about $30,000, and they bought all the chairs as an act of kindness. So they bought the chairs. Now, consider that and lay that up next to, uh, instead, the person goes out and they buy, they buy a brand new $30,000 boat. Okay, they, can, they buy the auditorium chairs or instead they buy this boat. On sunny summer days, you tell me where they're going to be. The person who buys the chairs is going to be sitting in this room. The person who buys a boat is going to be at Lake Erie. Because wherever our treasure is, our heart follows it. And he says here about the king, if he multiplies gold and silver, his heart is going to run after where that treasure is. So he he saw this day coming, and it didn't take long for the person recognized as Israel's greatest king, Solomon, to violate all three of those. It says that he had horse stalls for 12,000 horses. We're told, and this is the thing everybody knows about Solomon, he had uh, uh, 700 wives and 300 concubines or something like that. A thousand women. And it says in one shipment alone, he gathered tons and tons of gold. And when Solomon did that, when he accumulated the gold, when he multiplied his wives, when he built up his horses, as Israel's great king, He was legitimizing for every king after him. This is okay. And you find he set the template for how the the, uh, the kings in Israel would function. So let's go on to the next slide. What's our takeaway today? Kings come and go. Leaders come and go. Politicians, congresses, tyrants, dictators, court officials, they all come and go. But there is a future king coming to establish his kingdom on earth. But it functions by different rules. This is what Jesus would be like as king. He's a king whose crown is made of thorns and not of gold. He's a king who looks at the first and makes them last, and looks at last and makes them first. He's a king who wins by dying. He's a king who lives by turning the other cheek, who prays for his enemies, who gave up power in order to become weak, whose glory is not found in his appearance or his boasts or his commercials or his 30-second ad spots, but in his, in his, it's, his glory is in his serving. It's a king who doesn't want people to help him thrive, but who exists to help his people thrive. It's a king who dies for his people and whose mark is love, and who says to the weak, the exploited, the wounded, and the guilty, to me, and I will give you rest. He takes everything this world invests in power and authority and flips it on his head. The world worships power. He came to serve. Uh, The world prizes the ability to bend people to your will and to manipulate them to get what you want. And he comes and says, I'm here to serve. He flips everything on its head. And God here in 1 Samuel 8 warned the Israelites and warns us that when you opt for a king, no human king can ever deliver what you most want. They just can't. Because as as God said to the people in 1 Samuel 8, the king's primary focus 
will be on what he can take and do for himself and his power, the people come second. You say, well, you're painting with an awful broad stroke, broad, broad brush stroke. And, and maybe that's true. But I think when we look back at history, we will see whether you're on the right or your left, whether you want a candidate who's conservative or a candidate who's liberal, those people, once they're in power and they rule, always end up letting us down. And the reason is because they can't deliver. It's impossible for them to give what we want, what we deeply need in our souls. And so God said, when you trade me in for a human king, a human authority, you'll regret that day. Now, I'm not seriously suggesting that, are you saying that America is not a great place and so forth? Our Constitution and what our Constitution seeks to accomplish, it was a first in the world. What Abraham Lincoln said at the end of the Gettysburg Address is still true, that that government of the people, by the people, and for the people would not perish from the earth. But that Constitution and those statements of Lincoln are only as good as the people who have the power. And if the people who have the power go in a different direction, what God says in 1 Samuel 8 is true. The king will do what the king will do, and you can't stop it, whether it's personified in a person or it's personified in a government or in a Congress or whoever it is. Whoever holds the power is the point, and they will take. Now, next week when we come back, we're going to look at another word that, uh, that also kind of controls this passage, which is the king not only takes, but then the king gives. And we're going to look at the give part of that and what he does when he gives. What I'd like to do as we close today is to have us, as we, as we close, as we do with the song, is have you pray, whether in your seat or you can come to the altar, not just for our country, but praying for our own perspective and saying, Lord, have I believed what your word tells me in 1 Samuel 8? about what happens when we hand our, our power off to a human, another human being. Have we put so much, invested so much in a person or a movement or a political base or a, a political party that we've forgotten what the Bible says, that they will always disappoint? And even if you have someone who comes along and, and does what you want, there's no guarantee the person follows won't undo everything that person did. There's three things that a king will do, and I'll reference them quickly as we, as we close. There's no limit to the king's taking. He would take for his own purpose and plans, and you can't say no, because they got the power. So let's pause for a prayer, and then we'll open the altar if whoever would like to come and pray for our country, but also pray that we would Embrace what God says here in his word about the king and realize no human king can deliver what we desperately need in our soul. Only Jesus Christ by his cross can do that, who flips everything on his head, says, I come to die that you might live. It's a king who dies for his subjects. No king does that, but Jesus does that. So let's pray. Lord, the warning you gave to the Israelites through Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 8 was a warning given out of your deep love for the people. You knew that when they set you aside for a human king, that there would come a day when they would cry out, when they'd realize their mistake. And you were loving them and coming to them and saying, don't do this. This is a big mistake. And Lord, despite all the things, the freedoms and such we have in our country, ultimately, it resides in the people who hold the power. Sometimes they'll hold that power well, and sometimes they won't. But when we invest everything, Lord, into those people, we're setting ourselves up to be let down, just as God told the Israelites. And Lord, help us to do what you call us to do in the Scriptures, to pray for those in authority over us, but realize there's a king coming who's going to establish his kingdom and he will flip everything on its head as people will see that, that the true king, 
Jesus Christ wins by dying. He doesn't seek to be served, but he came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we sing, however you can best pray, whether it's here or where you're st- standing, I want us to pray for our country and for us and how much of ourselves we invest in a king that can never ultimately give us what we need.